Our next speaker is Carol William Westfall, who came to Notre Dame in 1998 as the Frank Montana professor and until 2002 as chairman of the School of Architecture. Earlier, he taught at Amherst College, the University of Illinois in Chicago, and the University of Virginia. His undergraduate training at the University of California was followed by a master's degree at the University of Manchester and a PhD at Columbia University. His publications include numerous articles ranging from antiquity to the present day, and two books, In This Most Perfect Paradise in 1974, and A Study of Early Renaissance Rome, and the 1991 book Architectural Principles in the Age of Historicism, written with Robert Jan Van Pelt, just to mention a few of the many books that he's written. His special interest has always been in the reciprocity between the political life and the, and the urban and architectural elements that serve the needs of citizens, especially now in the American city. His talk today is entitled, Fisk Kimball and the Jefferson Memorial, A Pyrrhic Victory for American Architecture. Please welcome Carol William Westfall. <clears throat> We've heard a few things about this already. We'll hear some more. Early in 1937, John Russell Pope's proposal for the Thomas Jefferson Memorial was made public. The Commission of Fine Arts immediately became enmeshed in a controversy that would prove to be a hinge between two very different conceptions of architecture. Is architecture principally a civic art that serves and represents the institutions of a civil society, or is it an, a fine art of self-expression? Does architecture serve and represent the nation and its citizens' aspirations, or the art world and its aesthetic infatuations? The proposal came from the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Commission that the new president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, had brought into existence in June 1934. Its 12 members included six politicians, three Jefferson descendants, and three appointees of the foundation that operated Monticello, among them Fisk Kimball, whose energy and expertise in matters architectural would dominate the commission. Elected chairman was John J. Boylan, a Tammany politician. Since 1923, Boylan had represented a Manhattan congressional district. He was a longtime Jefferson enthusiast and a director of Monticello's foundation. Outsiders often sat in on commission meetings, most importantly Charles Moore, <clears throat> although the commission he headed only had an advisory role on the actions of the uh, Jefferson Memorial Commission. He was, as we've heard, chairman of the Commission of Fine Arts since 1915. The Memorial Commission selected Pope as the architect and had him prepare proposals for five different sites. After reviewing them in May 1936, the president selected the site opposite the White House at the Tidal Basin that the Macmillan Commission in 1901 had produced and asked uh, for further development of the two buildings for it. In February 1937, President Roosevelt selected the one based on the Pantheon instead of the one shown here, which was, quote, much more like Monticello. On February 18, the Commission unanimously agreed to the site and the Pantheon scheme. The publication the next day of the exterior and interior renderings immediately provoked controversy. The Vox Populi was vociferous. It cried that the expansive formal site plan was an unwarranted threat to the beloved cherry trees. It also argued that in the midst of a depression, a proper memorial should not be a marble mausoleum, but something useful. To this, Fisk Kimball said, and I quote, the only memorial that remains as a memorial is not utilitarian. Commissioner and Senator Albert D. Thomas from Utah, with an eye on foreign events, had a similar question. The great question today is, quote, whether you are going to have a government by force or coercion or government by common consent 
and liberty. This is a monument to those last ideas. A more serious threat came from within the Commission of Fine Arts when it first formally received the proposed, commission, the proposed memorial on May 20, 1937. Despite the participation of Moore and others from the National Park and Planning Commission at numerous meetings and outside on-site inspections, the Memorial Commission was surprised that the Commission of Fine Arts, while approving the site, quote, disapproved the design. Commissioner Gilmore Clark complained that the commission had pre been presented with what he called a frozen design that precluded its offering advice and he objected to the lack of a competition. The Pantheon scheme was so large and so akin to the nearby memorial, uh, Lincoln Memorial, and its setting was so formal, the two would come into competition, even into conflict. It was too expansive, it would disrupt traffic and the tides, and it would obstruct the vision down the Potomac that was fundamental to the L'Enfant plan. The commission suggested taking the dome and the frontispiece off the Pantheon to make it a colonnade enclosing a statue or, alternatively, adapting Pope's 1925 competition winning scheme for the Theodore Roosevelt Memorial that placed an open split colonnade with a spritz of water on that site. Individual commissioners were dismissive Paul Manship, sculptor, said, cold, soulless, and too formal a representation as an expression of a memorial to so great a man who had such a warm nature. It is just too architectural. Thomas W. Lamb, architect, quote, it is a reproduction of Imperial Rome. I think it should be done in classical. It is Washington. It is the national capital but I do not think it has to be done in the dry, pedantic, stilted, academic style. I should say academic type. William A. Delano, architect, altogether too pompous. Charles Louis Borey, Jr., architect, it is too much architecture. I deplore that much architecture. Eugene Francis Savage, painter, I regret that this has not been exposed to the full possibility of American architecture today. And Charles Moore said that what is wanted, and we heard this earlier, is something quieter, more in keeping with Monticello. Professionals in architecture quickly organized the League for Progress in Architecture to fight the proposal's approval in Congress. Although the site's competition was based on the 1901 Macmillan Commission proposal, they claimed that the site betrayed the L'Enfant plan. They also called the proposed Pantheon anachronistic and unsuitable for its purpose, and they especially protested the lack of a competition. The controversy persuaded the Congress to declare the Tidal Basin site off limits while it considered the matter, thereby setting the stage for round two which unfolded within commission meetings and out of the public view. Representative Boylan responded to the, quote, disapproval by convening an, a conference on April 22nd involving various members of the three commissions and the architects. They easily agreed that the South Axis site was appropriate. In return, the Memorial Commission agreed to restudy the, quote, height and design of the memorial its terraces, and immediate relations. Uh, at this point, Frederick Law Olmsted became involved. On July 13, the Memorial Commission approved the reduced building in an informal tidal basin and moved it to the south. Meanwhile, external events were affecting both commissions. New men who would speak against the Pantheon proposal came on the Commission of Fine Arts. On August 27, Pope died, days after the memorial's funding was deleted from the next congressional budget request. And then at its September 29 meeting, Charles Moore, who would be 82 in two days' time, resigned the commission, resigned the chairmanship of the commission 
Although he remained on the commission, <clears throat> and after hearing what I've heard today, I can understand why he resigned as chairman. At the same meeting, Eggers and Higgins, who were Pope's assistants and who took over his office, presented their revised design of the Pantheon, but it was rejected with the instruction to make new designs, quote, in accordance with the previously made suggestions. On January 25, 1938, Chairman Boylan again convened a memorial commission meeting that include various members of the other commissions. The site opposite the archives was again reviewed and rejected. And then meeting alone in executive session, the Memorial Commission unanimously reaffirmed its, its approval of the revised Pantheon scheme on the tidal basin perimeter set amidst cherry trees. There followed a joint meeting of the two commissions on February 3rd where Kimball said that everyone wants this memorial, and this is typical Kimball language, to get going, and that the commissions needed to be in agreement to overcome opposition. Congress does not like the South Axis site, and Boylan is ready to give up on it. But Kimball reported, at the meeting of the Memorial Commission last week, we swung sentiment around again to the site south of the Washington Monument. Yet the members of the Memorial Commission still prefer the Pantheon design. The Memorial Commission presented three variations of that South Axis site. The Pantheon, I show them here in plan. The domeless colonnade. And the split colonnade. This is obviously the uh, very sheet that the Commission was looking at so they could compare the three proposals. Clark responded, I do not see how we on the Commission of Fine Arts could conscientiously, as individuals or as a group, give approval to the Pantheon because in our hearts and souls we believe it is not the thing to use. The meeting's participants agreed to have Eggers further develop the split double colonnade scheme and have it reviewed at a special meeting two weeks hence. An informal meeting two days later moved things along toward that February 17 meeting. Here, Kimball professed that in the face of the heated opposition, he was committed to getting a memorial, and for that, a united front was necessary. The Memorial Commission now found that compromise offered the best solution. In executive session, the Memorial Commission, as they said, in the interest of harmony, decided to accept the Theodore Roosevelt scheme's adaptation but also to submit the question of design to President Roosevelt for final determination. The next day, a bombshell. Pope's widow let it be known that she would not allow the use of that scheme. Kimball now upbraided Clark in a stern telephone conversation. His notes show that he demanded to know if he'd asked Mrs. Pope. He then said, and I quote from his notes, meanwhile, Eggers and Higgins have resigned. Edgerton Swartout is willing to take it on, but, and I quote again from his notes, he made some trenchant criticisms of the open party, and I stand with him. His retention would mean redesigns, reapprovals, and much delay. When you first came on our board, you did not object to the mass, only to the siding. But now, and I quote again from his notes, you have cost us, one, our design. We gave that up gladly for harmony. But now, two, you have cost us our architects. Eggers and Higgins were somehow mollified, but not Mrs. Pope, who remained unmoved despite entreaties from old friends. This left the Memorial Commission with the Domeless Pantheon. But President Roosevelt remained attached to the full Pantheon scheme. The Memorial Commission now simply turned its back on the Commission of Fine Arts. On March 22nd, it approved the Pantheon scheme and prepared an announcement for Boylan to make. The final formal presentation of the scheme to the Commission of Fine Arts produced the predictable rejection. It offered some more counter suggestions, which a few days later Kimball noted that their absurdity 
show they are in a last ditch of bewildered desperation. One of those, incidentally, was for the Alliston Island, which was to be turned into an aquarium. And another one was for a, uh, a planetarium opposite the Pantheon, uh, opposite the archives. On March 29, the Memorial Commission unanimously resolved to recommend the Pantheon design to Congress. And Boylan made his announcement. And the next day, President Roosevelt again requested funds for beginning construction. The funding request set off round three, which unfolded in public. The architecture professionals working covertly with Chairman Clark were now better organized in presenting their fundamentally different understanding of architecture from that of the Pantheon's proponents. The art reviewer in the Sunday New York Times explained that understanding quite clearly. Pope's Pantheon, he said, was admired first by citizens of an antique state. It is at home in Claude Lorraine's Italian landscapes. It presents the, what he called, regnant ideals of the old world. Now, with Pope's archives building and his National Gallery on the way, we, as he said, ought to preserve our capital forever as a mighty museum in which descendants of the pioneers might find eternally recorded the multifarious strata of our cultural life. What a rich mine it is. But to be a bona fide and comprehensive mausoleum for the ages, he continued, ought not its new acquisitions to be kept in some slight degree up to date as we proceed forward upon our path of destiny? We may, of course, have to wait 500 or 1,000 years for Congress to recognize what today, in less exalted circles, is looked upon with a measure of diffident pride as American modernism. But, he said, the present curators of our great architectural museum would doubtless with consummate argument refute the premise that Thomas Jefferson, were he to return, might side with the rebel forces in the present crisis of blast and counterblast. This was a clear and succinct statement that the principal obligation of a building is to be of its time and be suitable for a city that is first of all and principally an architectural museum. This was a novel doctrine in the Washington of the 1930s as events surrounding Alfred Mullett's State War and Navy Building, now the old Executive Office Building, begun in 1871, make clear. In 1917, when Pope, uh, when he served on the Commission of Fine Arts, Pope had worked up a scheme for its remodeling. The Secretary of the Navy, Franklin D. Roosevelt, enthusiastically endorsed it because it would, as Roosevelt said, get this building to conform with the general scheme of the Treasury. Other similar schemes remained unfunded and the building remained unchanged. But then attitudes about old buildings changed. In 1944, the Commission of Fine Arts found no reason to change the, quote, interesting old office building representing an era about 75 years ago when the French influence on American architecture prevailed. In other words, new styles make current styles old, and this change documents progress. Mullet's building is an older past. Pope's buildings are a more recent past. The present is the newly opened Folger Shakespeare Library by Paul Cray and Alexander Trowbridge. And the future, as Henry Russell Hitchcock saw it in 1929, is visible in the buildings planned for the Chicago Fair of 1933. That fair, as Hitchcock said, will in a sense annul finally the effect of the Chicago Exposition of 1893. In 1932, the Museum of Modern Art's International Style Exposition presented the future's buildings purged of their socialist content. Gropius's installation at Harvard sanctioned the style's transplantation to America, and historians such as Siegfried Gideon and Nicholas Pevsner spelled out its, inevitabil its inevitability. In this doctrine, Pope's pantheon was just another pantheon and anachronistic to boot. Joseph Hudnut, a Kimball protege who had 
just hired Kimball, uh, sorry, Gropius for Harvard, provided a concise summary of the architectural profession's argument. Pope's design is not of its time, it is not internationalist, it is not new, and it lacks an appropriate expression. It exhibits what he called hyper-orthodoxy, the essential creed of classicism that contradicts, and I quote, a time when architecture throughout the world is being swept triumphantly into new and magnificent modes of expression. Now here was the anti-traditional, positivist, zeitgeist argument of Hegel, Burkhardt, and Wolflin, and soon, of course, of Gideon and Pevsner, that would become dominant among architects, critics, and historians. Between 1876 and 1917, in the period of the American Renaissance, the period that Richard Guy Wilson has chron chronicled so well, it was acceptable to build pantheons in America. Pope's pantheon is that period's last gasp, a relic from the past, Kimball's trophy in his Pyrrhic victory over modernism. Now, at this point in the battle, the opposition looked so threatening, the Memorial Commission retained a public relations firm. Perhaps it helped, but the key was the energy of Roosevelt and Kimball and everyone in between in the spectrum of supporters. <clears throat> On June 3, 1938, funding was approved, and in the fall, construction began. The Pantheon's supporters, from Roosevelt to Kimball, understood architecture as Jefferson and Longfond had in 1791, and Macmillan and McKim did in 1901. And I might add more on the basis of what we just heard in the previous paper. Uh, Charles Moore, not M-O-R-E, the man. Buildings produce cities that serve and represent the political institutions of the nation that share roots in antiquity. As Senator Thomas from Utah put it, in the selection of the memorial and the site, we have had in mind one that would carry out, carry out the idea that this capital city of ours will be a grand city representing the ideals and the aspirations of the American people. Kimball said this in his pre-Gideon, pre-Pevsner History of American Architecture from 1928. I quote, the fathers of the republic were eager to throw off provincial dependence in other matters than that of sovereignty to get rid of colonialism of foreign authority. Noah Webster's dictionary did the same for language. The Declaration of Independence did it for the nation. And Jefferson did it to found a national architecture. He, I quote again, demanded logical system in thought and going to the sources in every field, close quote, in common law, in fossils, in biblical criticism, in the earliest precedents among the Anglo-Saxons, the Greeks, and Romans. Paradoxically, he also went to Palladio, <clears throat> quote, who passes as the chief representative of dogmatic authority, close quote. But Palladio, Kimball continued, and here is a slightly longer quote, had in common with nature this supposed lawfulness and reasonableness, which was doubtless what Palladio himself uh, felt when he wrote, architecture, the imitator of nature. Here was the relation to natural law, one of Jefferson's fundamental conceptions, close quote. So Jefferson now turned to the ancients, to the Greeks and Romans, this is still Kimball, whose republics then in the, re in the freshness of modern republicanism seemed very near. He hoped to secure the respect of foreigners without copying them, to be at once novel and correct. Quote, the classic ideal thus embodied was ultimately to rule in America to, to a degree unknown in Europe, but a generation passed before its sway became universal, close quote. Its hold loosened, as inevitably happens, but the classical ideal was recovered and restored, and Kimball continues, implanted in Washington in the Macmillan Plan and in the first buildings it brought into existence. An increasing internationalism, this is still Kimball, at the expense of national traditions now threatens this architecture as does a stripping of details from classicism that can, as he said, expurgate without bringing much that is deeply creative. 
That stripping was embodied in buildings by Bertram Goodhue and Paul Cray that the Commission of Fine Arts had approved. And so does a certain loss of momentum, the result in every artistic cycle, of the increasing distance in time between the founders and the current practitioners. These threats were the ones that moved Kimball to persuade the Memorial Commission to give Pope the job and without a competition. The old form of classical architecture is dying out, he said, and I have not the slightest doubt that it will be very difficult henceforth to carry on that sort of thing that is wanting for Washington and to find the right man to do it. McKim is dead, he continued, and so is Charles Platt. Edgerton Swartout is getting to be an old man. Whom would you put up against Pope? If you look at other buildings in the Triangle, two members of the Fine Arts Commission had designed them, but this is in the private session of the Executive Commission. <clears throat> Whom, um, if you look at other buildings in the Triangle, you will see how commonplace and inferior most of them are. Pope is the last great figure in the classical school which was refounded by McKim in 1893. There is a tremendous drop after him. What happens next? There will be a fight to continue the classical school, Kimball said, to which Representative Howard Smith of Virginia added, that is happening in the state capitals now. Then Kimball, very much so, and I am very strong for sticking to the last of them. The Commission of Fine Arts was in step with the changing times. Only a fight forced it to approve Bert Bertram Goodhue's National Academy of Sciences building in 1922. In 1931, it approved Pope's Archives Building virtually without discussion. But the next year, it endorsed the Folger Library, which was much like Goodhue's, more like Goodhue's building than Pope's. Go forward five years to the Jefferson Memorial controversy, and you will find that opinions about Pope's Archives Building have diverged. An opponent of Pope's Pantheon said it is, quote, in the grandiose monumental style, its purpose more or less successfully concealed by a careful classicism, close quote. But Chairman Boylan of the Memorial Commission said, it makes the other new buildings in Washington look like garages. Chairman Clark of the Fine Arts Commission added another element to the divergence in a final desperate letter to the President after Pope's Pantheon was under construction. He said, a canvas of the architectural and artistic professions in the United States would disclose, we believe, that among those most competent to judge, a large majority is overwhelmingly opposed to the creation of a Roman Pantheon of which there are already many in the United States. Clearly, those who were most competent to judge were the professionals from the several arts who served on the Commission of Fine Arts, not the politicians and others who did not comprehend that Pope's pantheon was anachronistic and therefore inappropriate. But Boylan and others, as we've heard earlier, knew what he wanted. He wanted to have a uh, he said, we wanted to have a memorial built to the honor of, honor of Thomas Jefferson, and our thought of it was that as a result of it, Washington would be a better and happier and more beautiful place to live in. In an article in the last month of the controversy, Arthur Upham Pope, no relation to uh, the architect Pope, had denounced what he called the bombast, abuse, ballyhoo, and intemperance of the small number of enthusiasts and declared that the modernist bias of their argument was untested by time. They did not ask, and here's a long quotation, what constitutes architectural excellence? Whence came the canons of architectural beauty? What is the aim and justification of architecture? And what can it express properly? Besides expressing its material and its milieu, architecture, if it is to be permanently effective, must express and render certain qualities that reside permanently in man's own constitutions. Democracy, for example, is not an affair of the moment, as dictators would have us believe. And it ought to be symbolized in forms that have proven their capacity to endure 
in forms deeply grounded in human nature and human experience and which carry worldwide conviction. The new memorial accepts and honors Jefferson's choice and represents it in a new guise, more ample and majestic, just as his ideal of democracy has, through national growth, triumph, tragedy, and deepening, deepening experience, become a grander thing than Jefferson foresaw. Senator Thomas alluded to dictators and democracies in his testimony to the House Appropriations Committee. I think no one in this day and age can depreciate in the least the value of monuments in reflecting the belief of the American people in democracy. I say that in the light of what is happening in the world and in the light of what is happening in our own country at the present time. Later in the hearing, Kimball defended laymen against professionals. Gentlemen, you are laymen. Laymen are the ones who are going to see this memorial, and we think that under American traditions, perhaps it should be a body of laymen which, after hearing all of the professional advice, should make such a decision about what to build. Kimball articulated what these laymen knew, but perhaps could not articulate. The union of form and content in Pope's Pantheon allied it with the tradition of architecture as a civic art that serves and represents civic institutions and builds cities. Its purpose is in the imitation of the lawful order of nature and its enduring principles. The result can be beauty, which takes different forms in different times and places. Such a building is a complement to a nation's constitution that also takes different forms in different times and places, but always within the framework of nature the nature named in the Declaration of Independence. Both the buildings and the constitutional order have the shared purpose of facilitating each individual's pursuit of happiness. The beauty of a nation's buildings and cities are visible declarations of that purpose. To achieve that purpose, both buildings and constitutions require continuity within tradition. The Federalist Papers are redolent with the idea, one that Kimball put this way in 1928, Using the Roman alphabet, the established universal forms of classical form, the American designers made what had been thought a dead language, the idiom of current speech, expressing with unexpected flexibility the ideas of a new age. In this controversy, architects who shun tradition and desire novelty faced off against professionals and laymen who extend tradition through constant innovation. Frank Lloyd Wright was the poster child of innovation. As the controversy wound down, Kimball pointed out that in 1917, he had been the first to celebrate the work, and I quote, celebrate the work, his work, as one of the great architectural creations of our age or of any age, close quote. But Wright has founded no tradition, such as the one that Michelangelo and Pope enlarged and there is no evidence that it is possible to build a monument in uh, what he said, under the guiding principles of the contemporary movement in architecture that Wright epitomizes. A little earlier in his obituary of Pope, Kimball had observed that Wright's is a voice crying in the wilderness, accompanied by a host of secondary men. The young now equate value with style. The functional movement is now misunderstood by imitators and travestied by speculative builders, and the international style is merely parroted and travestied by most adherents and admirers. The great artist in his work must be a bigot, even a fanatic, and is apt to be so in his thought. His error, it, it's itself forgivable, is only in his denial of the endless flux which brings his own work into being and will itself later be renounced. This is equally true of neoclassical architects, as he said, still involved in the passions of contemporary struggle, who cannot hope to achieve <clears throat> the veneration reserved only for the men <clears throat> who inaugurated vast movements of fundamentally original character, like Michelangelo, like the architects of Saint-Denis, and like John Russell Pope. His designs were ripened, matured, digested, transmuting the elements into a work that was his own. In a later letter, Kimball wrote, 
It may be contended that the day of the classic in American architecture is over. I am very sympathetic with the effort to rid the petrified forest of columns in Washington. But none of the architects who reject tradition have presented an argument or an example adequate to persuade laymen to abandon their adherence to a two millennia long successful conjunction of the principles that supported architecture's quest for beauty and the civil order's quest for justice. In 1944, Chairman Clark of the Commission of Fine Arts gave a soft core version of the innovative doctrine that would replace <clears throat> a traditional civic architecture with an architecture that is, quote, of its time. He said that his commission, this is 1944, has <clears throat> urged adherence to beauty of form, to excellence of proportions, and to permanence of materials. But he added that this was accomplished without those details on buildings which particularly distinguish Greek and Roman monuments, the strict and rigid compliance with the tenets of the classical school of architecture. These must be abandoned in favor of a more fresh approach to the problem which will confront the designers of new buildings in the future. Clark's diction reveals the new doctrine. The classical school is embodied in Greek and Roman styles. Tradition is merely a sequence of period styles in the past, and the past has nothing to teach forward-looking America. A new building was no longer an innovative renewal of Jefferson's American architecture added to L'Enfant's capital in the renewed and expanded form the Macmillan Commission had sketched. It no longer presented a new insight into classical architecture and in the, into the American architecture Jefferson had instaurated. It and the city it helped build was no longer seen as a beautiful embodiment of the justice sought by the constitutional order and that served and represented it. Ah. Here we go. Internationalism, not nationalism. Novelty, not beauty. And a vigorous anti-traditionalism became the coin of the realm. And the Commission of Fine Arts assumed the role of acquisition committee assessing aspirants to the world-class museum of architecture called Washington. Every new building would be of its time. Its forms would seek to bring fame to the architect rather than beauty to the city and those forms would be made obsolete by the accession of the next fashionable architect who was of his time. <clears throat> On the 200th anniversary of the third president's birth, President Roosevelt dedicated the last building in Washington that could make visible the lawful natural order of the nation's constitutional order and connect the nation's present and future with its roots in antiquity. Thank you. <clears throat> 